the Supreme Court decided on a 7-2 decision, in a 7-2 decision, that states can't tell women what to do with their body. That is a that is a violation of the 14th Amendment because women have the right to privacy and underneath the 14th Amendment, the, the courts decided that the state has to uphold a woman's right to privacy, that she has those rights granted. And that was a, a huge landmark case, right? And after this case, and when this decision was made in 1970, that was the last year that Henry Wade ever got laid. <laughs> Never had sex again, you guys. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, you might notice some people laughing in the background of these episodes, and that is because this was filmed in front of a live virtual audience via Zoom. Uh, I do these shows three times a month, record them in front of a live virtual audience, uh, and you can be a part of this live virtual audience by getting tickets to one of these shows uh, where you can go get your tickets at krishmohanhaha.com. They're only $5 for one show, or you can get a multi-show pass and save uh, a, a few extra bucks. Uh, but if you become a sustaining member of this show, either on Patreon uh, or directly on my website or via PayPal or through Bandcamp, various different ways where you can become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to come to see the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows, which eventually become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, which is awesome. Uh, and not only that, uh, but these shows are filmed in the River's Edge studio, which is part of the River's Edge radio network. And I couldn't be thankful for uh, more thankful for being a part uh, of the studio. Uh, the River's Edge is your place to get local Pittsburgh music from the Pittsburgh area 24-7. Just go to the TuneIn app, download that app, and look for the River's Edge radio network. It's a 24-hour stream of independent music. The radio station is independently owned uh, and is located in Pittsburgh in the heart of Millvale. So you'll be supporting an independent local radio station. So check them out. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to the shows, if you want to become a patron, if you want to make a donation, uh, if you want to check out past episodes of this show, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. Thank you very much. And now onwards to the show. Uh, America's Supreme Court is known as the most powerful court in the land, right? And it, at this point in history, it's more powerful than the executive and the legislative branch of the government, right, put together, which, let's be honest, not that hard to do. <laughs> not that hard to do, right? Considering most of the legislative branch is, is filled with geriatric hundred millionaires more concerned with ice cream and performative politics <laughs> than, you know, like passing laws and... And then the executive branch is just kind of filled with geriatrics with dementia and ideas that are terrible and equally terrible hair pieces. So <laughs> considering that's what we're working with, it's not that hard to believe that the geriatrics that run the courts and determine the ethics of our laws are the most powerful. <laughs> It's like the worst reality TV show you could ever watch. And really, I think if you're over 60 and can, can like complete a full sentence without slurring or spouting gibberish or saying something racist, I think that qualifies you to become president or have a seat in the Supreme Court. You know, the bar is set real fucking low, you guys. The bar is set really low. And sure, I'm sure some of you are, are looking at me going, Chris, you're being a purist. That's what you're doing over there. You're being a purist. But I feel like if I want a president that understands the difference between a noun, a verb, and a racial epithet, that's like the bare <laughs> minimum. 
<laughs> not really, not really asking for a lot there. But here's the real deal, right? The Supreme Court was, was never meant to have the amount of power that it has today. The founders and the framers of the Constitution did not want, to, uh, want the courts to have the power to determine our laws. They just didn't. That's not what they intended the court to do. So uh, what they did want the courts to do is, is when you get uh, called the Supreme Court in is when the lower courts can't decide on a ruling between any of the states or between a citizen and the states, right? They're the first courts for international law, which means that realistically they should be looking at the Julian Assange case. And they are the final court of appeals when you sue somebody. That was the purpose of the Supreme Court. And the first three Supreme Courts did exactly that, right? They were pretty uneventful. Not, not a whole lot happened in, during the Supreme Court. Uh, there was like one case where a farmer had to pay off his debts. That was like a case that they, they oversaw. That was the most exciting one uh, that, they, that they looked over. And Alexander Hamilton actually gloated. He gloated in the Federalist Papers that it is the weakest of all three of the governmental branches. May 28, 1788, Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist, quote, you know, and the problem was people were worried that the court, the Supreme Court, would end up being a monarchical branch of government, that they would end up being basically in charge of everything. And he says, the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three departments of power. It can never attack with success either of the other two branches. Well, clearly that's no longer the case. No, it is not. Right, and then here's, here's what did it. Chief Justice John Marshall. Chief Justice John Marshall came in and in the 1803 Marbury versus Madison case. Chief Justice Marshall decided that the Supreme Court has the power to deem federal laws constitutional or not. And of course, this made Thomas Jefferson just livid. He was livid over this. He said, if this decision stands, the Constitution has become a suicide pact. Under this construction, the, 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 the court is now a despotic branch of, of government. He, he, uh, he, he wrote to, uh, to Abigail Adams, he said, uh, who was a friend of his at the time, uh, even though he wasn't talking to her husband, he wrote to her and he said, uh, under this, the Constitution has become a thing of wax to be molded in the hands of the judiciary. Boy, Jefferson, really good with those words, huh? It's <laughs> called it a, de they called it despotic, despotic. And, and I mean, realistically, the courts granted their own power. That's really what they did. In 1803, they granted themselves power. And we, the people, just went, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. To, we're we're going to watch this game where, like, 22 dudes pile on top of each other to get, like, a leather ball with our hands. <laughs> We're thinking about calling it football. What do you guys think? <laughs> and it's you know, people running into and away from each other, all in relationship to the movement of a ball. Yes, which I feel like very exciting. Definitely something that we should pay more attention to. <laughs> USA, USA. USA. <laughs> yeah, but look, despite Jefferson's poetic and justified anger that would have given Shakespeare a run for his money, the courts didn't overturn this ruling, right? I mean, this is basically like a genie granting its own wishes, you know? And like the first thing they wish for is unlimited wishes. That's really <laughs> what they did. But really, I mean, there, therein lies the truth about the power of the courts, right? It's all wishful thinking. That's really where the power of the courts lies. It lies in wishful thinking. If we, the people, decided that a ruling of a court was a bad idea and pushed back against the courts, look, there's nothing nine geriatrics can do against the 99%, you know? And, and some of us were, are young and filled with all of our essential vitamins and minerals. I eat a lot of General Mills cereal in the morning. 
That's not true. I don't eat. I eat candy. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> but. But Jefferson was right about the court, right? About them being despotic and that they turned the Constitution into a ball of wax and molded it to what they want. Most of the landmark cases uh, that the court has decided on deal with constitutional rights. That's primarily what they deal with. And as in all things, it has led to some pretty great things. And a lot of times, shit that they're trying to just sweep under the rug and pretend that it never happened. You know, it's basically like the 80s. Nobody wants to remember the 80s, you know? <laughs> it was a coke fueled decade and too many fans of glam, glam rock, which is a genre I learned about this week for this joke. Now, <laughs> Chief Justice Taney, uh, the, the court that Chief Justice Taney was uh, in charge of decided the Dred Scott case. And at this point, you know, in the 1850s, the, the temperature on, on slavery was turning. People were, people kind of looked at it and, and didn't really like it because it kind of turns out that when you say black people don't count as people because you can't see them in the, in the nighttime, most Americans are kind of like off put by that. You know, like a lot of people are like, oh, that's fucked up. We should, we should probably stop doing that. And at this time, there were some states that were free states and other states that were slave states because, you know, the economy. And I, I, have a, I have a pretty simple rule, I think. I feel like we can all go by this rule. I think we can all abide by this rule. If you have an economy that can't run efficiently and effectively without the use of slavery, then maybe you're not ready for an economy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can you can go back to like trading sheep and rocks and anvils or some shit i don't know you can <laughs> we'll we'll make you in charge of 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 money when you figure out how not to own people for the sake of profit <laughs> then we can give you your money <laughs> now dred scott was was a pretty monumental case uh, Dred Scott was a slave that was taken to a, a free state by his master, and therefore Scott concluded that he was a free man and he had the right to determine his own life. So he chose to stay in the free state, which is something that he could do. And it, I think it makes sense to everybody, you know, and, and literally everyone that agrees that, I don't know, maybe owning human beings is a bad idea. That's something we shouldn't do as a society. But his master thought otherwise, of course, uh, and, may, and you know, this case made its rounds uh, in the lower circuit and eventually wound up in the desk of the Supreme Court. And Justice Taney, pictured here so elegantly, uh, thought he could put an end to the entire slavery argument using his judicial might, right? He could use the courts to once and for all make the decision on, on slavery. And he stated that uh, black people are not and will never be seen as people and therefore cannot get the rights of a citizen. If there was a mic, I think he would have tried to drop it and expected a standing ovation at that time. Like, dude was very proud uh, of, of the decision he made. Uh, he did not get a standing ovation. What he did get instead was a brand new set of robes. Yeah, uh, Justice Taney turned in his traditional black judge's robes for a more white ghost-like robe yeah oh, i see what you did there I, yep i did <laughs> and he started trying to go my supreme grand dragon tawny instead <laughs> oh some of you were like oh the kkk references and at that point i was like nope we're going one step further we're going one <laughs> step further. just like this motherfucker was like i'll go one step further than the constitution bitches <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this is a point of shame for the Supreme Court, right? Like, much like Germany 1936 to 1945, nobody likes to talk about this little piece of history. Usually when Justice Taney is brought up by lawyers and judges, they just start talking about the weather. You know, they're like, oh, look how nice it is. 
outside. Is this this is nice weather for July, isn't it? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. they, they're talking about cheese or some some shit, or like they're just like Lincoln was pretty cool, right? You guys like Lincoln? <laughs> <laughs> for the love of God, please anything but this. <laughs> And look, in this instant, Lincoln was pretty awesome. Uh, he pushed back against Tawny and disregarded his decision uh, and basically set out his entire administration to uphold equal rights for every single person. Now, Tawny, uh, <laughs> Tawny's decision did escalate tensions between the states because the free states didn't want to comply and say that, that black people should, are, are not people. And the slave states were like, fuck yeah, they are. This is pretty cool. And it eventually led to uh, the Civil War, which technically would mean that his decision was treasonous because that is one of the major re things that, that accounts for treason is if you start a war, if you wage war against one's own nation, that is considered treason. Uh, so therefore, I don't think he should just be disbarred from the country. Uh, I think he should have been disbarred from the entire throne of the Supreme Court. But uh, that did not happen to Justice Taney. Lucky for him, he died. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that's pretty much the only way Justice this can be replaced, right? Under the Judiciary Act of 1789, our very first president, George Washington, specified that there needs to be at least six judges, and they served until they either died or retired. And this, of course, creates loads of problems, right? If you have a bad president, theoretically, you can vote them out uh, in four years. And undoing four years of damage is far easier than undoing 30 to 40 years worth of damage. And that's how long most Supreme Court judges serve. They serve like a minimum of 30 years. It's not a requirement to serve that long, obviously. We just talked about that. But, but that's how long these, once they get into office, they live, is they live at least 30 years. Uh, and, and really think about it. Like not, nobody really retires from the, uh, from the Supreme Court. And think about it. Like if you were like a judicial genie uh, that could grant the wishes that you wanted or possibly your own party, that, that got you in wanted, would you really retire early to, you know, bring like a, a fresh new genie with like a whole new set of wishes? You know, fuck no, you wouldn't. <laughs> of course you wouldn't, right? Some of those genies uh, might think black people are like real people and like women should vote. Ooh, that those genies are basically communists and should have never gotten the power of wishes, you guys. You should have never done it. <laughs> and of course, nobody votes for, for these justices to, to take their power, right? That's not how the, uh, the, the justices are appointed. They are appointed by the President of the United States. You have to be nominated by the President of the United States. Your nomination needs to be approved by the Senate. And finally, the President must formally appoint you to the court. Because the Constitution doesn't specify any qualifications, in other words, that there's no age, education, profession, or even native-born citizenship requirement, a president can nominate any individual to serve. So far, six justices have been foreign-born, at least one never graduated from high school, and another was only 32 years old when he joined the bench. I'm going to be 32 in October. I should fucking be appointed to the Super <laughs> Yeah, man. That would be awesome. I fit all of those things. I, I know nothing about, I've never been to law school. I cut a much finer figure in a robe than Joseph's story. True. I feel like I'd fucking look great in a robe. Like on that alone. Right. You know, fucking this that entire would be audience in Ukraine, we should be the Supreme Court right now. I feel like we right can now. do that right now. Yeah. One, universal basic income. Two, Mitch McConnell shuts the fuck up forever. Three. <laughs> Stop Amen. nailing it. Look at all these fucking decisions I just made. <laughs> Three, nobody can ever tell me what to do. I get all of the chocolate. These are amazing. I feel like nobody can contend with these decisions. Intelligence agencies are unconstitutional. <laughs> Intelligence agencies are unconstitutional. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 
Look, <laughs> when you have when you have a president that, that that appoints somebody with this much power, it pretty much makes the executive the the courts the pimps of the executive branch. That's really all they do. The presidents become a hollow placeholder for a judicial monarchy, and that's what some people think that the Supreme Courts are, right? And and here's the thing, the Supreme Court is supposed to be apolitical to ensure that the Constitution is upheld the way that it's supposed to be upheld, you know, like for the fucking people. But the courts are like the most political branch of the United States government. First of all, you can't be apolitical when you have a political leader that appoints a judge for life. For life, they appoint the judges. Right, that's a very political decision to make. Right, and I wager to say that the judge making decisions over their interpretation of the constitutional constitution and the law, determining how people will live their lives for the next thirty years, is like the most political decision that you can make. Even the interpretation of the Constitution itself has become a political argument, right? A majority of conservative judges think that the Constitution and its amendments are rigid and never changing. And a majority of liberal judges believe that it's a living document that evolves with the times. And just the mere fact that amendments exist means that the document wasn't meant to be as rigid as some people want it to be. And these Supreme Court judges don't even see every case that comes through their doors, right? They're, they're very selective about what cases they, they choose to see. And even the selection process comes from cases that have to come up through the, the lower courts. They can't just pick and choose some of these things. They have to come through the lower courts and onto the desk of the Supreme Court, which means that a majority of these cases uh, get decided on by the lower courts and you know, uh, one side or the other doesn't like the outcome, so they try to appeal it, they try to send it to the Supreme Court, and nothing happens. So a lot of these cases, a majority of these cases, are just in legal limbo. But even though they make it sound like a right, nobody is entitled to an appearance at the Supreme Court. That's entirely at the discretion of the justices. And they choose very carefully. Only a small number of cases get to the Supreme Court, and it's getting smaller. Roughly 8,000 cases are submitted each year, but only 80 cases are accepted. That's a 1% acceptance rate. And to get to that 1%, most cases start at the bottom. The federal court system consists of three layers, and the lowest is the district level. If you lose in a district court, you can appeal to the circuit level. Most of the United States is divided into 11 circuits, but there's a 12th for DC and a federal circuit that mostly hears patent and military cases. Above the circuit level is the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, as long as you don't count the basketball court, that's above the Supreme Court. And look, really, they're not taking the most challenging cases once they get up to the Supreme Court, right? They're whittling things down on the cases that they feel like they want to take. And really, after five years and like super senioritis sets in, you're not going to take challenging cases, right? You're just, you're just going to fucking coast playing basketball till you die. That's, that's how 90% of the judges die, is they fucking pull a hammy and they never recover. And they're done. <laughs> Look, the Supreme Court has only uh, decided on one case involving the Second Amendment, one case. And in that case, uh, they decided on behalf of guns. They were like, yay, guns, right? <laughs> It took them till 2015 to make a decision on gay marriage, to say that gay marriage was completely full and legal in this country. And it wasn't like the Supreme Court was itching to make a decision on gay marriage, right? They, they, the only reason why they made the decision that they made is because Americans, a lot more Americans than they thought, were pro-LGBTQ. And on top of that, Mexico had already legalized gay marriage. And the courts were basically like, well, if it's good enough for Mexico. <laughs> That's why I have a new plan. And it's that uh, I'm going to call up all of the Supreme Court judges and let them know that uh, Mexico has like Medicare for all and universal basic income. So maybe they'll, they'll make a rule. <laughs> I'll put that shit into law. One of the most politicized cases of the last 40 years is Roe versus Wade. 
right? Most conservatives want to overturn this ruling because according to them, it's a law about killing fetuses. That's what they're doing. They're killing fetuses today. Tomorrow, it's going to be regular babies. And then, then we'll have legalized murder by Sunday. That's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, nobody tell the conservatives about what the American military does. Just <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't talk about the you know, legalized state-sanctioned murder that all wars are. Don't bring that up, okay? They just, you know, don't, don't bring up all those wars that they loved and dr dodged the draft for. Just <laughs> leave that one go. But to liberals, this is, a pretty important, this is a pretty big and important case because it's a key issue in women's rights. In reality, what it does is it upholds the right to privacy between a woman's health and her doctor. And it grants her that right to privacy so that the state can't make a decision on her behalf. In 1969, a pregnant woman in Texas couldn't afford to keep her baby. Abortion laws were different state to state, and in Texas, you could only have an abortion if the mother's health was in danger. And since this woman couldn't afford to take care of a child, uh, this brought up the issue of America's great poverty problem, right? It, it put a little bit of a, she, she shined a little bit of a light on the great poverty problem, though it wasn't the star of the show. It, did, it, was, it was a nice side character. Like if this was like a middle school play, like uh, the great American poverty problem was like a tree. Oh. You know? <laughs> like it was there, but everybody was like, the good tree, huh? Look at you not fucking moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that is probably the best metaphor for American poverty you're ever going to hear <laughs> on a comedy show. So you're welcome. <laughs> but this woman, uh, she found a law firm that was interested in taking down anti-abortion laws, right? Now, Henry Wade, the man that prosecuted Jack Ruby, went again Jane Roe. Jane Roe was the woman that, uh, that, that they, were, they were defending. And he lost. He lost in a Texas lower court. Like, even Texas looked at this guy and was like, hey, dude, I really feel like you should sit this one out, you know? Like, this is really not your penis's battle, like, at all. Like, I know you want it to be, but, like, this is super not about your dick. So, so look, Hen uh, Henry Wade was, was an honorable man, right? He's a Texan. He's a good Southern man. Uh, and he decided to do the most mature thing that he could possibly do, which is sue all the doctors that wanted to perform an abortion, which... What, what a graceful loser this guy is. Henry Wade just sounds like every guy at a bar that calls a woman a bitch because she, you know, asked him to put pants on in a public place. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, fine, whatever, I'll put, I'll put my pants on. You're, it's your loss, lady, you know, it's because... <laughs> Let me tell you something, broad, because he'd probably call her broad. <laughs> like, not like a fun way, like definitely like in a misogynistic way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, my Thank you for making that distinction. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, there's two different ways to say that word. Toots, I feel like the same way. Like when P.I. say toots, acceptable. When drunk assholes say toots, ooh, <laughs> who hurt you? Sir. That's <laughs> where it goes. But he would look at it and be like, look, my dick has won awards, awards that I, I gave my dick. So, wait out. <laughs> That's the type of guy Henry Wade seems like. But here's the thing, right? In the time that it took the, the, the courts to hear this case and make a decision, Jane Roe went, again, went ahead and had her child and then had to put her baby up for adoption. And at this point in time, in, in our time, in 2020, uh, the Supreme Court is primarily conservative and is filling up with judges that want to overturn Roe v. Wade. Because it won. The Supreme Court decided on a 7-2 decision, in a 7-2 decision, 
that states can't tell women what to do with their body. That is a, that is a violation of the 14th Amendment because women have the right to privacy and underneath the 14th Amendment, the, the courts decided that the state has to uphold a woman's right to privacy, that she has those rights granted. And that was a, a huge landmark case, right? And after this case, and when this decision was made in 1970, that was the last year that Henry Wade ever got laid. <laughs> Never had sex again, you guys. Right now, we're all afraid that, that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned, right? And, and that is a possibility, because if it does get overturned, it, the reality that we'll be facing is that it all goes down to the states. The states will go back to making the decision uh, for themselves. So each state will make a different decision. And we already saw something like this happen, right? In the summer of 2019, states like Alabama, Georgia, Missouri, Kentucky all passed these archaic anti-abortion laws from the dark ages. You know, at this point, we're really about three steps away from bringing back witch burnings. <laughs> It's very exciting, very exciting times, you guys. Now, even though this happened last year, despite the fact that, that state laws were, were in direct conflict of federal laws set by Roe v. Wade, and this, uh, but the Supreme Court just stayed silent throughout the whole issue. They never made a peep. They never really wanted to make a decision on this thing. But we, the people, were not. We, the people, went out there and fought this thing and made sure that, that women did have uh, the, the right to their health. They, they, they could make the decisions that they did have the right to privacy. And you know, not only does this bring up the issue of wrongfully shutting down women's health centers like Planned Parenthood in these states, but also the issue of poverty that Roe v. Wade kind of sort of highlighted. Think about it. In order to get an abortion of, of any, or, or any sort of women's health services, these women are now going to have to take the day off from work, go to a different state, get their services, which in some cases are not cheap, and drive back either the same day or stay at a hotel, which is going to mean that they're going to have to take another day off from work. And the cost of all of these things can potentially be enormous. And this is a really easy way to make poverty a crime, which is something Republicans love to do, while the Democrats placate and ignore it. Right? They're like, hey, look at that tree on stage. It's a nice tree. <laughs> it's a good tree. Is that birch? I think it's birch. Now, in order to overturn the ruling of Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court would have to take on a case from the lower courts that involved the issue of abortion similar to Roe v. Wade. Right now, there are two cases that fit that description. And they need, these conservative judges are going to have to give a good reason for their decision. And if they come out and say, hey, it's killing babies and we are valuing the sanctity of life, then I guess they need to start making a decision on American war crimes too, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they need to start calling in all the elites that have started their wars and, and unsanctified life for, for the last five fucking decades. Look. This is the highest court in the land, all right? We shan't have any hypocrisy. Embarrassing. <laughs> Can't have a war crime-sized egg on your face. That's embarrassing. And look, I know this is very scary, and I know there's probably a lot of people out there that, that are worried. And, and before we start freaking out and starting to panic and, and, and hoarding you know, condoms and birth control to peddle in a post-row world, let's... Let's all just take a breath, right? Whew. Courts only decide on hot, bus hot button issues when there is public put on them for, uh, or, or pressure put on them from the public. Just like Congress. Congress doesn't really pass laws that are ethical or for the people until we decide to put pressures on them. An eight hour workday was deemed constitutional only after the labor movement kept taking the issue to the streets. The same thing happened with child labor, right? The courts were the last branch of government to get involved in the civil rights movement. The courts didn't wanna make any bold decisions. They don't. They don't make any bold decisions unless there's a lot of people making noise. So if they start trying to undo Roe versus Wade, then we make so much noise that they can't ignore it. Now, fortunately, 
the thing with the courts is that they have been on the right side of history. A lot of times they have not. A lot of times they have been on the side of Grand Dragon Justice Taney. That's, that's kind of the reality of the situation, right? The reality is that there are more stains on the robes of the Supreme Court than clean spots. I don't know if that's the way that saying goes, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like, look, the Supreme Court has, has, has way more dirty laundry and no more quarters to operate the washer and dryer of justice. Which might be a good thing because Lady Justice is blind. So, you know, she can't see that mustard and civil rights stain that's like right there on the Supreme Court. The argument for these lifetime appointments is that these folks are vetted by Congress for at least 60 days, picked by a president who we all know is, has always been good people, right? These are good people <laughs> that you want to sit down and have a beer with. That's how we decide on elected officials that are going to pick people to be on the highest court of the land is can we get drunk with them? These are the arguments that we make. But most importantly, most importantly, the people that are in the Supreme Court are paragons of virtue. One of their roles is to protect the fundamental rights of all Americans, even as different parties take power. With the tremendous impact of this responsibility, it's no wonder that a U.S. Supreme Court justice is expected to be, in the words of Irving R. Kaufman, a paragon of virtue, an intellectual titan, and an administrative wizard. Yes, of course. <laughs> Paragons of virtue. Like Roger Taney. And, and wizards. <laughs> yeah. These two men, these paragons of virtue, said black people aren't people, but corporations are so virtuous. So virtuous, you guys. In fact, Waite decided that women don't get the right to vote, and murderers who kill black people get to go free. Oh, the virtue. Right? And Waite is also the person that determined corporate personhood and, protected, and, and said that they were protected by the Constitution. And if you murder one of them, then that is an act of treason. That is an act of treason, you guys. And look, the legacy, this virtuous legacy of Morrison Waite can be seen all across our history today, right? And, and you see it more and more in killer cops that go free after they brutalize and kill black people. We just saw that early this week with Breonna Taylor. And even when they do get a sentence they deserve, they, we have a justice system that wants to lessen their sentence because they're police officers. The highest court in the land just gave cops a literal free pass to kill minorities in America, and there's no calls to overturn these laws. In fact, in modern day, in our day, the Supreme Court has decided that they will not overturn qualified immunity cases. Qualified immunity is offered to police officers so that they can't be sued for killing, maiming, or injuring citizens while on duty. And once again, this is another free pass to kill and brutalize black people in America. That's two get out of jail free cards from a court that has upheld some of the most racist decisions in the world and a couple of civil rights ones. And a couple like pro, they were like, we'll give, we'll gi we'll give civil rights this win. You know, we'll give them one. Fuck, Monopoly doesn't even give you two get-out-of-jail-free cards. These motherfuckers. Then we have the virtuous William H. Taft, who literally forgot that he was president when he was Chief Justice. It's, it's a real thing that happened in history, you guys. The virtuous members of the Taft Court decided that minimum wage was unconstitutional, which led to private bargaining, which gave corporations a leg up. And this is why minimum wage has been stagnant for a decade. And who could forget Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said that the, the Espionage Act and the Sedition Acts don't violate the Constitution, or, or don't violate First Amendment. So you can imprison anti-war socialists for making speeches. Yes, of course, guys. Why not set the precedent that you're against the working class saying that they don't want to die for the causes of the rich. Look, saying speech is warfare is just like saying corporations 
are people. It's equally virtuous if virtuous suddenly means insane in this context. <laughs> and all of these cases dripping with virtue, so much virtue in these cases. Let's not forget this great paragon of virtue from the Stone Court uh, that said that Japanese exclusions during World War II were fair and fine in a state of emergency. That's right, finally, you guys, a loophole to federally mandated racism. Yes, haven't we all been waiting for it? And we have F an FDR appointed Supreme Court judge to help us out with that, to say yes, yes to internment camps. This is, this ruling is just oozing with, with virtue, like a, like a candy bar with a, like a nice caramelly nougaty center. This is just like, this is what led to and justified Muslim persecution in America uh, after massive terrorist events that were caused by extremists. And with all these virtues, the government backed by the courts can deem that we are now in a state of emergency. And things like Black Lives Matter and anybody that claims black people are cool or supports this movement can't be near a police station, areas where cops patrol or even have been seen to patrol. patrol. And yes, this includes mall cops. And instead of arguing that this is a violation of clear violation of First Amendment rights, they would argue that cops are in peril. They're in danger from these protesters with their signs. And, and that this state of emergency means blue lives matter is constitutional. That's what this means. Look, the only way blue lives matter is ever relevant is when you're talking about the Smurfs. <laughs> That's the only way. Then, yes, Blue Lives Matter. If America was a true democracy, then we would be voting for, at minimum, six judges every eight to ten years. But we're a corporate oligarchy, and henceforth, we have a court that runs like a judicial monarchy. The argument that was being made by people who didn't want the Constitution to be ratified was that the Supreme Court the way that it was configured in the Constitution, it would have enough power that it would be able to strike down laws and therefore it would become more powerful than the executive or the legislative branch and we would cease to be a democratic republic and start being a constitutional monarchy, right? So that was the argument that was made. And of course they did solidify corporatism into law with the ruling of Citizens United. Now, here's the thing, campaign finance laws uh, were just boring enough that people weren't going to pay attention to it, uh, and it made it the most attractive thing for the forces of evil to target. And this involves like the most important thing every four years to the American public, voting and elections. And money in politics has been a very long standing issue, right? In fact, corporate personhood was a decision that was only made because the Supreme Court was paid off by the railroad corp companies. And in, in Teddy Roosevelt, when he became president, uh, was the first person to set up an anti-corruption bill in the Tillman Act of 1907. The Tillman Act of 1907 is the first federal legislation that is going to have some type of impact on campaign finance. And what it basically did, what it was ban corporations from giving money directly to candidates. Now, this introduced the idea of political action committees, which really sounded like they were going to take to the streets and fight for your right to vote for that one approved candidate that they approve, and only that one. Uh, only <laughs> one. You can't vote for anybody else, right? This is, I mean, really what it did is uh, it, it was like a corporate crowdfunding campaign for a political candidate. That's really what these packs ended up becoming, right? And that's really what it's coming down to, folks. That's where our elections are going. We have GoFundMes for politicians. That's what we have here. Now, the Federal Election Campaign Act established the Federal, action, uh, Federal Election Committee and limited what the political action committees could do. And obviously, this pissed off the corporations that really wanted to control these elections. They were real jazzed about it. 
And the final nail on the head came from the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, or BCRA, which prevented political ads from being played 60 days before an election. So if you're wondering uh, why they concentrate about 46 political ads into every commercial break of a Jeopardy episode, this is why. This is why they have to do that. They got to they gotta push that propaganda and make up for lost exploitation. And I'm going to do, this is world famous, I'm going to do uh, my impression of this is what every political ad ever looks like, right? It says, America's in trouble. There's crime everywhere all the time. There's a crime being committed in front of your face 125% of the time. And you can't see it because immigrants have stolen your jobs and your eyes. <laughs> it's time we buy back the American vision and save America by making visions in America with this candidate, despite the fact that they've never done anything to help you or the working class ever. But they'll do it this time specifically for you. <laughs> yeah. Paid for by the campaign for America's vision made by the flags of America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking every... Nailed it. Bad ever. <laughs> now, here's the thing. The, the PACs did find a loophole to this. They did find a way around it, right? What they did was they started focusing on a very specific issue in their commercials. So basically repeat everything I just said like 10 seconds ago, but instead of like a candidate's name, you just replace, the, replace that with a word like healthcare or guns or freedom or some shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, is I really miss my calling it to go into advertising apparently, is <laughs> I'm really good at it. <laughs> that would be my pitch too, it's just like, should we just say freedom or some shit like that? <laughs> Can we, what if we throw a fucking eagle into it, is that good? Can you pay me now? <laughs> <laughs> and look. Here's the, these are advertisements, right? So lies are not just allowed, but they're actually required in these ads. It's a requirement that people need to, and that was a Supreme Court decision that not a lot of people are willing to talk about, right? Propaganda v. Truth, or Propaganda 1, sadly. And, you know, that was just, they had better graphics, more celebrities, a lot more bribes. <laughs> propaganda, and it was really good. Propaganda was really good in that one. Now, here's the thing, Mitch McConnell and the NRA actually tried to sue Congress over the BCRA and then they lost, which then led to the NRA News Network being established on Sirius Radio, which is now considered a legitimate news network, you guys. <laughs> the NRA News Network is real and it makes Fox News sound like Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> like a way more, ra like a racist Sesame Street, but I think you guys get the point, right? But that's where we are in America, right? In America, a pro-gun corporation is called a news network, while publishers and real journalists like Julian Assange are called hackers and terrorists. With the Citizens United case, a conservative group went after Michael Moore's film Fahrenheit 9-11, claiming that it was a, a political ad and it was coming out too close to the elections. But the group lost the battle since it was like a movie and, and not like a political ad claiming we're all going <laughs> to die all the time unless we vote for this one corrupt candidate from the corporate parties. <laughs> the FEC uh, did not decline this group. They, they lost it. And uh, uh, that, became, uh, that began their game of, of cat and mouse. So uh, this conservative group decided that they're going to create their own movie company called Citizens United. And they created a documentary called Hillary, the movie, proving once and for all that conservatives have no creativity. They got none, <laughs> right? You could have gone with a, like a way more fun title, right? Like the woman behind the man, you know? Like the BJ that brought down America, right? <laughs> It's a solid one right there. Or even something <laughs> innocuous like the Clinton files. <laughs> you probably get a copyright right? <laughs> <laughs> for the music, but. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Citizens United made this documentary about Hillary Clinton, and what they were planning to do is release it via video on demand on Comcast. Yeah, that's that's where this movie was, you guys. It didn't even go straight to DVD. It went straight to fucking on demand, <laughs> right? It's it's literally one step above a made-for-TV movie starring Kirk Cameron. For real. That's where it's at. <laughs> the only way they, the only way this situation could have been sadder is if they sold it to the fucking Hallmark Channel, right? Oh. It's <laughs> the only way. Is that too far? Is that too dark of a joke? It's to bring the Hallmark <laughs> Channel into it. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're, you're good, homie. You're good. <laughs> but here's the thing. They paid Comcast a million dollars to put it on their platform. Right? So the FEC fought back, and their case went all the way to the Supreme Court, who ruled in favor of Citizens United. Right? The majority ruling uh, and the opinion was written by Justice Kennedy, uh, who, who basically said that free speech shouldn't be limited, even if the speaker is a corporation, and removing all limits on corporate funding. Right, kind of, kind of, really fucking doubling down on that corporations or people thing, you know that uh, that that old Morrison Waits put out there. And at first, this ruling went through twice. By the way, uh, they brought the case back into the courts. They did this twice because the first time they made this ruling, they did it specifically for the ideological group Citizens United. And then they decided we need to go even further and undo the BCRA. This final, this final decision made money and speech the exact same thing. So the more money you have, the more you can influence election and legislation, and that's deemed as free, the, the freedom of speech and press, right? It's literally the, the put your money where your mouth is decision. That's what this became. This led to something awful. It, it, it led to the creation of super PACs, which are organizations that pretty much have an unlimited cash flow. Uh, especially for electioneering. That's primarily what they do. And once again, this was put into place to protect corporations, right? Super facts allowed companies like Target to back up candidates in secret so that they can continue to turn a profit without putting a target on their back. Huh? Boom. You guys see what I did that one? I did. <laughs> That's fine. Let's just watch the fucking clip. <laughs> because what happened is corporations quickly f discovered the high price of free speech, right? So corporations like Target backed a uh, anti-gay candidate for governor um, and uh, all of a sudden found their stores being picketed across the country because people were furious that they would be supporting such a candidate for governor. So corporations quickly found that it's not cheap to engage in political speech in the marketplace. They didn't want to do it like that. Instead, they wanted to find a way to channel their money into dark money organizations or into what evolved after Citizens United, something called super PACs. So super PACs were created not by the Supreme Court. Super PACs were created by a lower court that said, well, if you can spend unlimited amounts of money, you should be allowed to give unlimited amounts of money to an independent political action committee. That was the super PAC. Supreme Court has never ruled on that question. Yeah. And they have every opportunity to because it was part of the, the lower courts, which means that if, if it's continued to be pushed, and a lot of people have been pushing the, uh, the Supreme Court to overturn their decision on Citizens United, but they have made a decision that they're not going to, right? And here's the other thing with, with, uh, with these super PACs is that they're not supposed to have any any direct party affiliation uh, with the candidate that they're raising money for, but <laughs> when have rules stopped party elites, you guys? Super PACs are not <laughs> allowed to coordinate with the candidates. So in a sense, they're supposed to be separated from the candidates. But in many instances on both sides, you have Democrats and Republicans that are in the political party system running these super PACs. So many people point to the obvious conflict of interest they have, that they know the candidates and that they're probably coordinating even though they say they're not coordinating. Now, the founders and the framers of this nation uh, were trying to ensure that this new post-royal government would lack corruption. 
And in the span of 200 years, the Supreme Court has made this government into one of the most corrupt in the world, right? The Citizens <laughs> United ruling is an insult to every single person that wrote and signed the Constitution. And as much as the Supreme Court has decided on landmark pieces of legislation like Brown versus the Board of Education, Roe v. Wade, an eight-hour workday, it's done way more harm than good. And the good that it's really done primarily came when there was public pressure to take on cases. For the most part, the Supreme Court upheld the rights for corporations and ensured that people are left behind. Well, the court has uh, over over the, I don't know how many years it is, nearly 90 years, I guess, since uh, the, the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, legalized unions. Uh, there were a few years there when they were on, on the side of unions, but starting in the 50s, really, in a big way, they just started taking apart union power. And they've continued doing that right up to this day. Um, they defend corporations over people regularly. Um, they have always been the very last to defend civil rights on the occasions that they have. And uh, most recently, you know, John Roberts famously gutting the Voting Rights Act, which has led to, you know, massive voter disenfranchisement. Um, the, the list is long, John. It's a long list. The nine justices who sit at the court at this point are way more powerful than the president, the entirety of Congress, and possibly, possibly also Oprah. <laughs> Mate, very good. We have very good evidence to prove that. Do they have a book? Does the Supreme Court have a book club? They, they, there's a, if they don't, then they'll rule on favor of one. And it'll be a, <laughs> my guess it'll be a 5-4 decision, right? Like, Brett Kavanaugh doesn't strike me as a reader. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Unless, like, you put... He likes beer. He likes beer, though. Big fan like of beer. beer. Big fan of fucking calendars. Yeah. So if you, make, if you can get a book in a calendar <laughs> form, boom, he'll read that shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a beer of the month calendar. <laughs> boom. Oh, yeah. Brett Kavanaugh's favorite thing solver. right there. We got it. Who's got him on his Chris? Who's got him? Brett Kavanaugh as their secret Santa this year. Who's cut? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking get that guy. <laughs> A beer of the month calendar. Look, speaking of Brett Kavanaugh, there, there is fear that the next 40 years of decisions made by the uh, courts are going to push back any of the progress that we have made, right? And, and that very well may be true because who knows? what's going to happen. I, I have no faith in either candidate picking a, a legitimate good person to be on the Supreme Court. But one of the fundamental things that we are, are forgetting here is that the courts gave themselves this much power. That's what they did. And the, and the people just accepted it. So why continue accepting this much power from a branch of government that has failed the people monumentally countless times? It doesn't make any sense. Look, the Constitution itself says that the government that stops representing its people means that the people have the right to overthrow it. It also says that Congress can make laws so that the courts can't review it. That's part of, uh, that's, that's part of uh, Article, Article 2, I believe. Article 3? Article 2 or 3, one of the, whichever one states the Constitution. Sorry, I'm, I'm having a little, little memory lapse in that. But Really, if the, if the Congress had more control and, and could dictate whether the Supreme Court could review certain laws or not, then we would live in a fucking congressional monarchy instead of a judicial one. But if courts and Congress begin to make decisions that we don't agree with, then we the people, as a collective effort, start pushing back to show them who really has the power. And we're already doing it. Look at all the protests that we've seen this year. Look at the labor movement coming back this year with, with over 2,000 strikes. We're already pushing them in the right direction. The Supreme Court of the United States, or SCOTUS, as they're, uh, as they're known amongst the, the popular kids, uh, controls and dictates uh, some of the most, uh, major laws that we have seen in this country for now. And yes, SCOTUS does kind of sound phallic. I know that. 
Okay, they're about two letters away from being the ball bag of American politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and really with the way that it's set up, SCOTUS really just cradles <laughs> the, uh, the other two branches of government in a nice judicial sack that protects them, <laughs> you know, from the abrasive <laughs> cl climate that we're seeing, a climate of, of uh, activism and, and proletariats that are truly fighting for justice and equality granted to all citizens under the constitution. The end. Thank you guys very much for hanging out tonight. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you, you are, you're sharing this out with your friends, with your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy this show. Uh, and, and more importantly, make sure that you are subscribed, whether that you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're watching this on Facebook, listening to the audio version of this show, uh, or on rockfin.com, which is the uh, ad-free blockchain cryptocurrency site where the content creators are a part of the company. So uh, there's no censorship, there's no ads, and we're, we're all part of the family. And if you become a subscriber over at Rockfin for $10 a month, you get all of the exclusive premium content, not just for myself, but from all of the creators on Rockfin, people like Graham Elwood, Ron Placone, Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore, a uh, ton of people that are on Rockfin. So uh, make sure you are subscribed. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to these live virtual events that happen three times a month on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. You can also become a sustaining member to get free tickets and additional bonus unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content. Uh, you can um, also make a one-time donation. Check out all of my stand-up comedy albums. Uh, keep up to date on what, when my live shows are coming out uh, and sign up for my email list. Once again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A -H -A. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next week.